applications. We're really excited to welcome you along today to this event as part of the CIRA Conf 2021, which focuses on international themes in educational research. And because of that, we're keen to welcome some international speakers who's going to focus on key working through the pandemic. So this is a panel session. It's going to invite practitioners and researchers in the earliest field to reflect on the international resonances found in experiences of working through the pandemic. Although holding key worker status, earliest professionals in Scotland rarely achieve the same visibility or recognition as those in other educational sectors. Together with presenters from New Zealand, Iceland and representatives from Scotland, we're going to explore the impact on practitioners, particularly considering emotional well-being during this period. So I'm really excited to welcome along three really good speakers. Firstly, we have Gemma Patterson, uh, who is the lead earliest pedagogue uh, with Falkirk Council in Scotland. We have Kristen, uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Akureyri. I hope I pronounced that correctly in Iceland. And a very good evening to Tony Christie, who is joining us from New Zealand. And Tony is a director of the Child Space Early Childhood Institute in Wellington, New Zealand. So all speakers are going to have uh, probably five to seven minutes just to speak initially. Um, on their own experiences in their particular context um, during the pandemic of the pandemic over the past year. And we're going to open it up into a panel discussion in the second half of the session, and that will be led by uh, Liz and Marion in, in that session. So feel free to post any questions in the chat and we'll try and get on with those and answer those as the session goes on. For now, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and hand over to Gemma Patterson to get us going. Uh, thank you. I'll just share my screen. So, good morning, everybody. Um, and I'm delighted to be here today just to um, meet with everybody. And I think the CIRA um, Network's a really rich opportunity for us to come together as um, practitioners and researchers and really dig deep about really what's happening. In the early years, I've been asked to speak about um, marvellous meal times today and really the impact on that um, with children's wellbeing and our practitioners' wellbeing as well, especially during a time where um, things just couldn't happen as normally as they could have. So, marvellous meal times for us was created in 2018. It was an approach we had developed on the back of the 1140 expansion in Scotland where children's um, hours in ELC increased to around six hours per day um, and it's really been a significant approach in Falkirk to really develop children's health and wellbeing across um, snacking and meal times but primarily the lunchtime period and really for us our hope that this approach really ensures that all children enjoy and hurried snacking meal times and there's a relaxed and a hurried atmosphere as possible and we explore the unhurried child it provides rich opportunities to really foster children's social well-being. It's regarded as a rich learning opportunity and we expect that staff are, you are able to plan carefully for these experiences with children and that they play a key role in intervening early with young children and families in fostering a healthy relationship with food. And during the pandemic and particularly during times where there were a lot of restrictions, restrictions in place when we were in ELC, when we were able to be in ELC. It was really important that these messages or these values were really underpinning what we were doing, even though it looked a wee bit different. With marvellous meal times, we know that it looks completely different in settings across Falkirk, just depending on different contexts, the different children you have, or the different spaces that our settings um, have within their reach. However, we, what we say is that if we have values underpin the approach, then it should look high quality in each ELC setting. Now, obviously, during um, the pandemic, when we were in ELC, um, these values had to be adapted slightly because there were points, you know, that um, self-serving couldn't take place. A free, free, free flow approach had to be a bit more structured just because we were having to deal with um, Lots of different factors, especially for practitioners when they were having to clean regular, regularly. We were um, you know, maybe working right to capacity because we had lots of absences, people were shielding. Lot, 
lots of different experiences that everybody at th that time was experiencing. However, we took the values and we adapted them so that we were supporting practitioners to think about how marvellous mean times would look in a slightly different context. So things like for relaxed and hurried meal times, well, it couldn't be as free flow, it could still be relaxed and hurried. We could still ensure that children were able to experience lunch in small groups with key adults, were able to have a choice about the food they were, they were eating, were able to still be involved in menu planning, even though things just did look slightly different. I think it was really important for us that we ensured that children's voice and choice was still a really important factor within snack and meal times, and that it really was paramount, paramount and at the forefront of our approach. I know that a lot of practitioners who had delivered marvellous meal times to a really high quality experience before had really felt pressured. Um, there was a wee bit of anxiety around um, the approach looking slightly different and they felt they just weren't getting it right. So I think for me, my role was really important in supporting practitioners and facilitating the dialogue around how could we ensure that the approach still was high quality, even though things were really a wee bit different. We also found that things like visuals were a great way of ensuring children were able to take part in um, express their voice without having to self-serve, for example. Um, and then cooking and baking experiences for us was also a really vital experience as part of Marvellous Meal Times. But again, th there was anxiety around that for practitioners. Due we were saying to them that they would have to cook in kind of smaller um, groups that children have to had to use their own resources, for example. But then we found that actually, do we have three if everything that we used to be can cook, probably not. So again, it's going back to issues around budget, just resources that were on hand, what practitioners felt confident delivering those kind of experiences because we had to remember we were, we were in a time where everybody was dealing with COVID, for example, and still are in work, out with work in every aspect of life. So it was really hard, I think, for practitioners to try and separate that work and home life and to get that balance. So I think for us, it was really thinking about the, the dialogue, the support we could give practitioners on the floor. Um, and really, I think sharing and having that network, we began different things like blathers in Falkirk, especially during lockdown, for example. And our, our blathers were really, really popular and we actually felt that it was such a good opportunity to get our practitioners together to share a wee bit of what was going on, for example, Marvellous Meals or Outdoor Learning. Um, and really try just to get practitioners to talk to each other, to share ideas, to talk about barriers and come up with solutions together. And they were really, really popular. What we found um, during the pandemic as well, or especially when we were um, returning to ELC, was that practitioners were then maximising the use of the outdoor space. And I think that was probably one positive that came from our experience was that practitioners are now more confident in using the outdoor spaces or local green spaces available to us, especially for things like marvellous meal times. And most settings now have created outdoor eating areas where our wee ones can choose where they would like to eat. So I think it's um, what we've dealt with a lot in the past few years. I think it's also about trying to pull the positives from that and really look about um, how we've kind of adapted practice and developed it for the best in some ways. Family engagement. Um, you know, practitioners really had to dig deep and think about how we were going to engage with families in a slightly different way. Um, before we had things like family lunches or family breakfasts, for example, but those were things that we just couldn't do. During lockdown, where um, we only had key children in our settings, um, we had to really think about how we were going to engage families through different initiatives. So we had developed um, Falkirk family posters on a range of different aspects, you know, from reading stories to outdoor learning ideas, and we had baking and cooking together as well. And what we did is we set up a kind of template and then gave it to settings so that they could personalise it with videos from own practitioners within the setting um, or with the different ideas if we knew there was a wee interest there. And they were actually really popular and we found that most families engaged either through Twitter or um, some of our settings were using apps like Seesaw. 
and we were able to um, have videos or photos of children cooking and baking at home and then practitioners were able to create, engage in that dialogue with families and children which was a really really popular um, experience and I've now that I'm allowed back out and about um, I found that some practitioners have actually been able to you know, print off those photos or those experiences and they're now in children's learning profiles within the setting. So again, we've kind of made that a part of um, a child's learning journey or their life and it's really nice to go back and reflect on that. I think maybe um, one of the most difficult things for our practitioners was probably trying to engage um, families that were particularly hard to reach. And I know that was... Um, you know, a, a point of anxiety for some practitioners, especially when there were ones who weren't maybe taking up key worker places um, and we were, weren't really able to reach them. So I think for us, it was really just trying to be as creative as possible um, and just trying to encourage, you know, a wee phone call now and again, a couple of photos, just so we could see what we ones are up to and try to keep in touch with our families as well. Um, so that's really an overview from me on Marvellous Mealtimes in Falkirk um, and how we've had to slightly adapt it. I mean, I could probably speak for longer around Marvellous Mealtimes and how things have changed. I think um, coming back into ELC, you know, really officially when um, we were returned earlier this year and then again in August, things are starting to take root again and we can see the approach really starting to build up. Children can self-serve now. We're um, beginning to get into the community a wee bit more. And you can really see that practitioners are taking on learning points and key points of development from the pandemic, from when things were a wee bit different, and are trying to use that learning to ensure that the, the approach is as rich as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gemma. That was brilliant. I'd love to hear a bit more about social media and all of that, but we'll save that to the panel discussion <laughs> in the second part. Um, Kristen, are you ready to go? Brilliant. Okay, I'll share my screen. I am more in the usual style of <laughs> conference style and uh, uh, prop both uh, uh, partly because uh, I want you to be able to follow my English. Uh, but um, I'm going to give you a little uh, short talk about COVID-19 and the Icelandic ECE, or we call it preschool mostly, so I may slip to the word preschool. We actually call it play school in Iceland. Uh, a bit about the research. Uh, we have been following data, uh, following the early childhood education from March to 2020. And we've done three surveys and 14 interviews, and we've done a survey through every um, wave that has hit us. And this, those are just articles that we have been working on and published. Uh, I will go to the first wave, and the conclusion from the first wave was that people were uh, feeling proud uh, of being key workers, being this, uh, having this uh, status as a, a key worker, but at the same time very worried because they didn't have any kind of uh, protection like people in the uh, medical field had. Uh, there was a lot of workload, uh, more workload. Uh, we had to, uh, people had to uh, established boundaries and, and um, small groups. Uh, they didn't have time. To, nobody could meet. It was the one meters rule inside the preschool between the pedagogues. And, but at the same time, people said that this gave them opportunity to try out what they call a blueprint for a good preschool because uh, they had smaller groups, fewer children and more relaxed, uh, uh, more relaxed um, atmosphere. But at the same time, uh, as I said, it was conflicting emotions. It was both being proud and very worried. And, uh, and the pride was connected to being this key, uh, being these key workers. But also this, somebody felt that they were thrown under the bus. They would just, you, you should do it, you should just try to do it, and you don't get any kind of uh, a regulation or help from, from the government to, to how to do this. Uh, here is a quote from one of my, uh, one of, my, uh, of our uh, participants. I did not choose to be a frontline worker, so I'm, I experienced an anxiety, but at the same time, I was proud to do my duty. 
However, I was worried about being easily infected at work and that I would uh, bring the virus home to my family. And this was 8th of April last year. So this was kind of a, a, a giving implication to how people was feeling. Uh, I, we took it down to a few, uh, or I took it down to a few uh, uh, main themes. And people, were, there was a lot of discussion about this, are we part of education or are we service? Are we just a service for the, uh, for the community, for the, uh, for the uh, working life, or, or, or are we here to educate children? And in Iceland, we have a law on preschool that says that the preschool is the first part of the Icelandic uh, uh, educational system. It has the same status, teachers has the same status as in early childhood as in, uh, for example, primary school, they're in the same unions, but uh, there is not the same uh, value or respect for the, the work of the early childhood people as for the people in the, in the primary school. Uh, this was seen, as I said before, that the, uh, the, that, um, the government didn't know so much about the preschool, so they put the regulation which uh, con the content was not appropriate for the preschools. It was not possible for the preschool to follow some of the, uh, so from some of the regulation that was put out. And, um, and they were also asked to do a lot of jobs that are not uh, part of their job description that came up. And they also thought they were very powerless concerning their uh, conditions. They just had to do what was handed out to them, so to speak. Uh, I think uh, we found out that actually during the second wave, there was more uh, worried, people were getting more worried about getting uh, the, the disease uh, than in the first wave and partly it is because in the second wave, in the first wave there were fewer children in the preschool, uh, it was, they were never locked and they never closed, but uh, some people uh, decided to have their uh, children at home, not all, but, and then some people had children coming few days, not other days, so the children got fewer. So they thought that was kind of uh, made this time bearable, but at the same time during uh, the second wave, that was not the case. Then all the children were in the preschool and the staff and they had to the do all of this. Somebody is having, okay. Uh, they had to have this, um, uh, all of these uh, barriers or borders that they had to put up and uh, and at the same time people were getting sick or if you for example uh, thought you were getting sick you were uh, mandated to go to test and from the time you uh, ordered the test until you got your results it could be up to 24 hours and that meant you were not in being able to be in the preschool you have to you had to be in a, a, a isolation and that meant that people kind of, uh, there were fewer people in the preschool and all the children were there. So, uh, and we also found that anxiety was a factor that separated groups in within the preschool. And we found that young people and unskilled people, uh, workers were more likely to, to be uh, and, uh, exper uh, experience an anxiety compared to those with a teaching license. And that's the same this was about the pride and worried. Uh, and I just decided to end with this one. Yesterday I broke down and started crying in front of a group of children and got a panic attack as a result. Uh, I also uh, put up uh, in on my second slide. Here is an article. This is an open published article. This uh, number two is about uh, employees perspective it's about the how the felt about being working in the preschool and there's a lot of data there and then there is another one coming about the children in the in the preschool during this uh, uh, challenging time so uh, and we are also writing one about the uh, the leaders of the preschools so I think I have used up my time 
<laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for that, Kristen. And I really liked what you were saying about the end there, about kind of stratification according to skilled and unskilled workers. Um, perhaps we can pick that up in, in the panel discussion. I'm going to hand over to Tony now. Well, kia ora and um, hello from New Zealand. Um, I am, I'm Tony Christie and I am uh, the director at Child Space Early Childhood Institute. Child Space is a, a group of early childhood services uh, in Wellington in New Zealand in the capital city. Um, and our experience of the pandemic has been, I think, probably quite different to others in that all the way in New Zealand, we, well, we have a, a big moat around our two islands. So um, it's kind of been easier to keep the uh, keep COVID out. And our country took an elimination stand on COVID. So from the very beginning, um, the first cases that came into the country numbered in the very few and our government chose to lock down uh, hard and fast so what that meant was a lockdown in the sense that I don't think other countries necessarily saw and that meant that our early childhood services closed completely along with every other workplace and every business um, so basically everyone was at home except for I think you're calling them key workers we call them essential workers and that did not include preschool teachers so um, it was only supermarkets and health um, urgent emergency supplies that kind of thing and that was our, our lockdown in New Zealand back in 2020. And that lasted for about five weeks. Uh, and we were able to keep up an elimination stance on that really right through until this year. Uh, and I think um, we've had the benefit of being able to, we've had the um, good fortune to have a vaccine available before COVID has really come to New Zealand. And so COVID has really only come in the last few months, but at this point, our country is almost 90% vaccinated. So, um, it, you know, we're having a very different experience of this pandemic. It's still been very concerning for people and, you know, there's been worries and, you know, plenty of really hard, fast lockdowns has meant obviously plenty of worries for uh, our business communities and so forth. Um, but um, what's happened most recently in early child for early childhood is actually that vaccines have been mandated for all early childhood teachers. So mm -hmm. in order, so it's a kind of a no jab, no job situation. And that has, it, it hasn't impacted our workplace because all of our teachers chose to be vaccinated, but I have heard a lot of stories from other people where they, they're so understaffed, they've had to close their centers or they're really struggling to get staff because they have teachers who have chosen for whatever reason not to be vaccinated. Um, so the mandate vaccinations really have been splitting workforces and even families uh, in New Zealand where they're saying, well, if you don't have a vaccine, then you can't see your grandson and this kind of, you know, different things. Um, we also at, were very fortunate in that not at any point during this pandemic so far has it been mandated for early childhood teachers to wear face coverings or masks. And I think that we just really advocated very hard for the idea of, for very young children, the emotional regulation of not being able to see facial expressions in their entirety is actually very damaging for the very young child. So, um, and also, you know, we, we have a, a, a friend who's an audiologist who's talking about the difference for young children in their language development. Um, from from not being able to see the movement in mouths and things, um, but also just that intimacy of um, mask wearing in in a, in a in a space like an early childhood service. Um, what else can I tell you? 
I enjoyed Gemma's meal times. It looks a lot like we would talk about being rituals, and we found the same thing. We've always had a, uh, we've always taken a ritual approach to our meal times, where we share our meals together with, you know, we start, we light a candle and say a prayer, and you know, breathe together, and then be present for our meal time together. But the children all serve their own meals and things like that. Whereas in the different levels of COVID restrictions, we have had to restrict that uh, and we've had to serve the meals for the children which actually coming from the way our children are used to things that has been quite restrictive for them they've felt the 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 um the change in the level of autonomy and power that and control that they have because we've had to serve and give them that and that's something they're used to really doing for themselves um it's a little other notes, we got very good at Zoom calls and uh, during lockdowns and things, we got used to doing all our learning online, but also we were able to, each of our teachers has a small key group of children and part of their responsibility in lockdown was to stay connected with those children and families to help them not to feel isolated. So we had teachers telling elaborate stories online and uh, having, we had very innovative uh, Zoom mat times with you know three-year-old children where they would all be showing their special objects and things like that so we had a lot of fun with doing mat times and stories and and phone calls I remember I was um I was dropped down the back of the couch at somebody's house the, the, the three-year-old I was talking to just kind of lost interest and put the phone down the couch um at one point so um, <laughs> you know that that came with its own interesting things and we were, at, uh, as we sort of came out of the more restrictive lockdown and we were in a, a more sort of cautious phase um, in New Zealand, that was, we had a level system, level four was complete lockdown, level three, early childhood services could be open for those essential workers who needed them. And at that point, we had what, what were termed bubbles. And so the idea was you couldn't have a group bigger than 10 children and you know um so there was a certain amount of only those children and teachers could be uh in their in their bubble um yeah i think that's probably all i can say for now maybe if you know i think that new zealand has handled the pandemic very very well we've been very fortunate in our geography and also just some of the decisions that were made very early on around attempting an elimination strategy for a long, long time, which actually served us really well, um, gave us gave uh, the country enough time to, you know, get largely vaccinated, I think is probably the main points to make. And um, I think that, uh, yeah, our government has, has been very good leaders uh, throughout this as well. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to maybe just let that go to the discussion now. Thank you, Tony. That was really, really interesting. I'm sure there'll be some food for thought there. I'm going to spotlight the speakers and also Liz, who is now going to facilitate the panel session between um, the speakers. If I can just find you all. I think Liz was doing it at the same time as me. So. No, I just took my put my camera on. Um, yeah, brilliant. Okay. okay, thanks, Shad. What uh, time scale do we have here again? Just looking at my. So we've got until ten o'clock. Got until ten o'clock. Um, so thank you so much to all three of our speakers. That's been really interesting, and it's really interesting to see the sort of commonalities, uh, as well as to actually see the differences. I'm just going to remind people, please do um, pop in any questions uh, onto the chat. I'm going to be keeping a wee eye on the chat and um, I can either ask your questions for you or I can, I, you know, we can sort of highlight you so you can ask your questions yourself. Um, so, just, I mean, I've, I've heard Gemma, I think this is the third or fourth time, Gemma, I've heard you talk. And I think the first time I heard you talk was way back in a very early, Sarah, early years at Network, where we all we all sat together and we all had a soup that Alien Wendy made us, you know, and it was very informal. And to see the sort of the journey of Marvelous Mealtimes 
you know, what would you say has been the most sort of important aspect of that, you know, to actually sort of roll it out across the region? I think um, what we've found in Falkirk is to actually have somebody leading that. So somebody that can um, provide support, can be on the floor with practitioners and give them that practical um, experience I've found can be most helpful. I think we've delivered um, marvellous field teams at Blethers and we've got a network. But actually, when I'm in setting, speaking with practitioners, speaking with children um, and really just practising, I think that's probably when we get um, the most benefit that kind of scale and spread approach and in Falkirk is equity and excellence leads we're all about scale and spread and what we found is starting slow and building up which we did in Falkirk there was only two years that delivered marvellous bills and now we've got over well, we've got all, all our settings over like 65 um, implementing marvellous bills but because we took our time um, thought about the, um, the solutions to the many barriers that we came across do you know and really kind of had open communication with other services because we had to work closely with people um, like catering, but catering didn't have a background on early learning and childcare, so their focus was food safety, was food routes, was trying to um, make sure temp checks were done, whereas we were all about the pedagogy, so it was trying to find a middle ground with them as well, just to really share. So, because uh, obviously Falkirk has a wide range of catchments, so you go from be from uh, sort of very affluent areas, you've got a lot of deprivation. You know, did you find any sort of difference in the approach or in how things, because you spoke in your talk about hard to reach families. Yeah. So do you want to sort of yeah. expand a wee bit on that? We found, um, I was in a um, setting in any area of deprivation when I was an equity and excellence lead. And um, I found that with our families, Marvellous Meal Times is actually a really rich way to engage them, especially through things like um, family lunches or family breakfasts. I think it was just a really natural way to get families in without the pressure of catching them when they were at the door or at the end of the day. You know, some of our families didn't have a good experience with education in the first place, so barriers were already up. Um, so just getting them in, just to experience lunch, to sit alongside them and eat, really helped open up dialogue. And we found that our relationships with families actually got much, much better. Instead of things like stay and play, where it's, it's a bit awkward for some families yes. to come in and do stay and play where they didn't actually know what they're supposed to be doing. Whereas if we're saying come in for lunch or we're having a, pic a picnic in our local green space, come with us, there was a bit more of a focus. So right. I think for our hard to reach families, that was really good. I think what we found with Marvellous Meal Times and areas of deprivation is that we had to really strip things back, especially at the beginning of a year when we had lots of wee ones starting with us. So them, some of them hadn't sat at tables before or used cutlery or hadn't experienced some of the food on offer. So we couldn't go um, rushing in full, full free flow because some of them just couldn't cope with that. So I think it was thinking about your context and building it up. So that's, that's and building those relationships. You mentioned earlier about Seesaw and I know that Tony was talking, you were talking a lot because uh, uh, obviously with COVID, um, many of our uh, early learning and childcare settings were open. And obviously, uh, Kristen, you know, you had that experience as well. Whereas in New Zealand, you, appear, you know, apparently you sort of all of your settings closed down. So you were talking about Zoom. Um, has the effect of that carried on? Uh, you know, once everything started to open up again, you know, I've Tony, so have you uh, still maintained that sort of level? Is there an expectation from families, perhaps, to have that level of social media content? No, there was. I think that was very much a a substitute for being together in real life. Uh, to some extent, when we were at the more that the lesser level at level three, where we were open for just some children who who were the children of essential workers then we were still providing that kind of online content for the parents who were still at home with children. And a lot of it was just about helping those families not to feel isolated or to feel alone because we very much, you know, were in this lockdown, which meant that you were at home in your, in your family and, and seeing no one. Um, but no, since we're all back together again, because we're very much under, at the moment in Wellington, where 
under uh, where we're at now is level two, which is um, kind of, it's, it's basically, it's almost business as usual in the early childhood service. It's a little bit more hand washing and a little bit more, um, you know, we're serving the meals instead of the children serving their own. And we um, and, and parents are asked or are encouraged to wear masks, uh, face coverings into the center. Um, but apart from that, it's very, you know, very business close is normal. To, very yeah. close to business as usual at the moment. Yes. Oh, we can, can, we can only dream. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say in, in Iceland, we also shifted to social media and, and e-posts to the parents. And we also, we had also this problem with uh, some of the children from immigrant groups, especially from Eastern Europe, because they were following the news there and not following our news. So they didn't trust in our system in a way at the same level as, as the Icelandic parents did. So we had a, a, a bit, th those children were more likely to be at home. We also had more of the children that needed support uh, to not getting the support, maybe coming to the preschools in some cases, but not getting the support because uh, we had to uh, kind of uh, thin out uh, the, the working mass. So, you know, a, a person was assigned to a group and that meant maybe uh, some of the children that had support, uh, their, their assigned person was assigned to a group. Uh, we had the same with, uh, uh, with the meals. Uh, children are used to serve their own meals, and now there's somebody uh, serving the meals for them. And, uh, and I think that was uh, also very difficult for both uh, uh, the teachers and, and the staff and the children, because, you know, those children were playing with the so same eat, uh, items, same uh, Legos, for example, and then they came to the lunch table and then they were not uh, uh, allowed to touch the same things. Uh, we didn't have uh, face masks, for, not for children and not for, for the staff in the schools. But what we have now still is that in very many preschool, uh, the, till the drop off, uh, the children are dropped off, you know, you know, I don't want to use the word delivered, but uh, when they are coming to the preschool, it's outside. In many cases, they still keep on doing that. That we are, our parents have not. Uh, uh, the, we have had times that parents are allowed to come in the preschools because it goes up in up and downs in waves. And now we are in in, in the fourth wave. We are, it's actually on the way down, but still. And at that time, we closed uh, the, uh, the doors. So we used our outdoor spaces for, for uh, when, when children are coming in. And that also means uh, there's a lot of, uh, of tension because you don't have the same opportunity to speak to your teacher about your child. And also, especially during the first wave, when people were very scared, uh, some of them thought the parents didn't always um, uh, give them their personal space. They kind of invited their personal spaces. So they kind of, it was kind of a dance between the parents and uh, some of the parents, not all of them, obviously. Some of the parents, and because they wanted to come into the face of the, of the teachers, but the teacher didn't want them to be in their face. So I don't know if that would be a... That, that may be something I think that people find difficult to get over. We've, we have a question uh, uh, from Eliza uh, Schofield asking, you know, and you've touched on it there, how did family engagement work then for family meal times during restrictions, but possibly more, more generally, you know, sort of if you're thinking about the sort of hard, you know, the hard and fast lockdowns at the start, you know, and was there a sort of loss in that relationship and how, how do you then build it up as things begin to open up again? We were we were actually really surprised. Um, one thing that I that I'd like to kind of point out, and that is that the big learning for us in this whole thing was actually that children are far more resilient than than adults. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we were surprised that after far, you know the first lockdown ended up for some children being as long as six or seven weeks. Mm -hmm. For children of you know around that age two, you know, kind of you know as young as two or even younger, 
we actually felt like it would be difficult to resettle those children into the environment. We, we were prepared and we were preparing ourselves for this idea that the children would need to resettle um, and that they would that, that they would feel unsettled. So we kind of put in all these extra, um, you know, some of us who kind of not usually teaching, we all were, you know, there ready to be helping out where we needed. And after anticipating this big issue, there was none. Well, what we found was in fact that the children came back into the preschool, saw each other, gave each other a big hug and carried on like they'd just been playing together yesterday. It was really the adults who were shaken by the whole experience and needed more time to settle back into the environment. Uh, we have in, in Iceland, we know that uh, some of the children, if I, that's not came not from the research, but just for um, speaking to uh, leaders preschools and which, and they told me that uh, they found out that, or they have the feeling that some of the children that uh, were kept away from the preschool through the whole first two, three months, they kind of were a bit uh, later. And, you know, they had, they thought they find kind of a, a development mental, uh, differences between those children that have been staying at home without be meeting anybody and those children that had been in the preschool for the whole time. So that was what we found. But I saw also there was a question about uh, the colleagues. Yes, um, Aileen Wendy's just asked, um, to what extent has COVID affected working relationships with colleagues as well as parents? And I would like to, Kristen, sort of You'd, you'd mentioned about the, the difference uh, b between the sort of the unskilled uh, worker, presumably within uh, early year settings and the teaching. So, uh, and the fact that teachers were less fearful. So, you know, obviously there has been a difference between colleagues, if you'd like to, to yeah, talk a little about that. Yeah, that was one of the findings, and we think it also has to do with uh, uh, the young people that are working in the preschools are maybe about 20, 25 years old. Those are the people that went through our financial collapse about 10 years ago, and they were a teenager at the time. So this is kind of a second very big crisis in their lives, uh, outside crisis that controls their life. And uh, so we that's our thinking, and, and but we know that uh, research around the country, uh, like uh, like medical research, show the same tendencies. And it, I think, it also has to do with educational level. That the older people have more education, more experience. They can have more maybe ability to follow up on the writings of, for example, medical writings. So, but uh, but obviously, we found people that are very scared and people that are not so scared. But we have now, we are just closing it, so we I don't have the real data yet, but a survey that's going out and we asked about the ethos, about the, 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 the culture of its preschool. And they say that the working relationship and ethos of the preschools has been going down. And it's it's remarkable much how it's been going down in this uh, now. So it, people are getting very tired and it's getting to the nerves and it's getting to the working ethos. So Pip has come in and uh, following from what you said, Kirsten, about uh, younger EYPs, you know, practitioners being more uh, anxious and asking, is it this has the same been replicated in Scotland and New Zealand? Gemma, can you uh, is that something you've witnessed? Um, I, I probably um, we've we'll probably experienced a range of practitioners, a range of ages experiencing anxiety or mm. concern around the role, and I actually think it probably comes down to the culture within each setting and maybe um, the leadership around that and how maybe even COVID within each setting has been dealt with, if you like. I think one of the issues we are finding with newly qualified practitioners is that most of these um, practitioners have qualified where they've maybe not spent a lot of time either on the floor getting practical experience. 
Um, there will be done most of their um, classes online. So it means that they're coming into settings really with no practical experience, just a lot of theory. And we all know that most of the time, practical experience looks completely different to what we read sometimes. Um, and we really need to try and gain the, the real life example. So I suppose one of the things we're finding with practitioners is there's a lot of frustration with um, within staff teams where we've got a really um, a mix of really qualified and experienced staff. There's maybe new people joined with the, not the experience and that causes a bit of anxiety. But what we've also found as well is because people were working in bubbles for so long, mm -hmm. teams then split, they're now back together and we go back to that storm and formance stage of team development. So everybody's in that stage, they just try to find their place again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. I come, sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying because I was talking to a a a, a head teacher just yesterday, and she was having a planning day at the preschool, and uh, which are part of our system. We have few planning day a year, and uh, she is still not able to have the whole group together because of the restrictions. So she is working. Uh, she is actually zooming into separate department of the of the preschool. So that's obviously puts mm. a, a lot of restrictions on, on how people work together. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, is that something that you've experienced or because I mean, New Zealand has had such a marked uh, difference in experience than Iceland and Scotland and, you know, many other countries. Mm, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Gemma. I don't think that the I don't I. It's not obvious to me that it's particularly younger teachers that, that you know, I, I think, you know, she's she's bang on. It's, it's about the culture of the place, the leadership. Um, mm -hmm. I think further than that, too, it's personal experience and so forth. We were in a sort of a we're in a fortunate position to be able to ask teachers when we went from lockdown, everyone's at home, nobody comes to work to level three, where we had where we were kind of obliged to open for. Uh, children of essential workers therefore mm -hmm. making us essential workers but we were able to ask our whole team of about 60 who wants to come to work in level three mm -hmm. and we were able to basically honor everyone who wanted to be at work could be at work and there were only enough children for that to kind you know to, to, to all work out and it it just sort of worked out but it, I wouldn't say that it was older or younger that predominantly turned up at work it was just more about even people's own home circumstances some of the teachers were just going crazy at home and would rather be with the children at work um, others were no I've got you know um, vulnerable people in my family and I don't want to expose them so just a raft of different experiences with it I saw another question pop up there about um, the well-being of children who might have suffered bereavements due to COVID and I think that's a really a really really important and significant question and it's not one that I can answer because it's not one that I've had any experience with as I say we've been very sheltered from the um, you know we have a, a our death toll in New Zealand is something like 25 for the whole two years. So, yeah. yeah I, th I think the idea of resilience is something um, that is going to be ongoing because I think we don't know either for practitioners or for children or for families, um, mm -hmm. you know, how people are going to come out of it. And as you say, you know, children have proven themselves to be very resilient. Mm -hmm. But uh, Aileen Wendy was asking, is this something that we're going to have to keep uh, an eye on in the future as things open up much more normally. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to just as a, I'll maybe sort of wrap it up as a last sort of comment from each of you, because uh, I think we are beginning to, to run out of time. So how, how do we support children and families coming out of COVID? I think for, um, for us, especially when there's new children transitioning into the setting because unfortunately parents um, can't come in. Um, that's opened up a wee bit more but because they can't predominantly get in um, I think that might cause a wee bit anxiety for um, new parents coming to a setting and even just establishing relationships from the get-go so I think it's just trying to be creative about how we can get parents involved and trying to um, 
develop those seamless transitions into a new ELC setting for these wee ones who have spent most of their life in lockdown or in a pandemic, mm -hmm. do you know? And thinking about actually our practice needs to change. That needs to change to go according to what these wee ones need in their stage of development. And maybe what we've always done doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just been reflective in that manner as a team. Mm -hmm. I think it will be similar to in Iceland, uh, the, the, this period when they are, uh, the transition period to the preschool from the homes uh, has been happening through those waves. So it has been happening outside, not inside the preschool, which is a bit of a different from, uh, you know, the usual work. But uh, I think people are doing their best but it's been a challenging time and it keeps on being a challenging time. Mm. So I don't know if that give you any answers. I, I think um, this final question is really just all about relationships and yeah. all of early childhood is just relationships and, mm. you know, kind of relationships are the answer to every question we have in early childhood. We need to make sure people feel safe, mm. first of all. Um, and that's really hard in a, in a pandemic. And, um, but one of the things that we also, uh, we, I would like to see happening more in early childhood as we do open up and as we see things progress forward. And that is because relationships are so important, the idea of having a home visit as some part of our transitioning experience to come from home to an early childhood service is such a massive step for a young child, but for a young child to see their teacher or kayako, as we would call them in New Zealand, in their home means they can trust them. And especially after such long periods of having to be in lockdown at home means only the people you can trust and love you very much are there for these children who, for that's all they've experienced. Then if the teacher is invited into home, then that means that they can trust them, I think. So, I, I mean, I, I think that would be really worthwhile um, trying as part of our settling going I, forward. I would also like to point out that we have, and I know it's been uh, everywhere in the world, we have more domestic violences now than we had before. And that will affect the children that are involved in those situations. So we also have to be prepared for getting a lot of emotionally uh, troubled children into our preschools over the next uh, few months and years yeah. because of this uh, kind of a wave of violence that has been part of the pandemic. So <laughs> on the sober. <laughs> Very, very, very sobering uh, thought, but I, I, I thought that we have to be aware of, you know, and again, that highlights again the importance of relationships and building relationships yeah. with yeah. So, uh, trust. Well, absolutely. So thank you so much. I think that's been very, very interesting. I see that Shad's come back in and has control of the comm. So I'm going to pass over to Shad to uh, wrap us up for this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you, Liz, and thank you to Kristen, Gemma and Tony for a fantastic panel session, a fantastic hour, really. I think we probably only scratched the surface here in terms of emotional well-being. There's much more we can talk about. I'm just going to share my screen before we go um, and say goodbye to you all. So thank you for joining us. Um, we would like you to keep the conversation going. Um, you'd be welcome to tweet along on Twitter using the hashtag uh, CeraConf2021. If you want to find out more about our forthcoming events in 2022, please feel free to join our mailing list. I put the link in the chat um, and you can follow us on Twitter at Sarah underscore EY. All that's left for me to do now is say thank you to the speakers. Um, go and enjoy the rest of your days or the rest of your evenings, Tony, uh, if you can. And thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Shed. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Thanks. Bye.